On today's show, what is pastoral counseling? This is Ask a Christian Counselor, where you can receive solid, practical, and biblical answers on whatever personal or relational issue you are facing. Tress Adamas is a master's level pastoral counselor in Phoenix, Arizona. Here's Tress. Hi, my name is Tress, and welcome to the show. Well, if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time, you know that we tend to focus on two different types of discussion on the show. We will either focus on one specific issue in counseling, such as depression or anxiety or relationship issues, or we will discuss counseling, specifically Christian counseling itself. For this episode, I wanted to talk about pastoral counseling, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is, but I am a pastoral counselor, and I am a member of AAPC, uh, the American Association of Pastoral Counselors, and I actually serve on the board of the Pacific Region, and recently went to their leader summit that happened just this past February in 2018. And I wanted to get various perspectives and explanations on what pastoral counseling is. So I recorded a roundtable with several of my colleagues there, and the conversation was fascinating. And the thing about AAPC is it's not Christian. It is open to people of all faiths. Now, there are many Christians in the organization, but it is open to people of all faiths, and it is dedicated to the integration of spirituality and mental health. And I just wanted you to hear this discussion because there's a lot of fascinating insight that I, I found from this conversation. I've listened to it a couple times. You know, I was there, I was recording it, but still, uh, just a lot of uh, amazing things that were said. And so I wanted to share that with you. And if you're interested in AAPC, you don't necessarily have to be a counselor or even a pastor. If you're just interested in the kind of work that they do, which is this integration of spirituality and mental health, I encourage you, go to the website, aapc.org. And you can connect with other members in your area. So go to aapc.org. Without further ado, this is our conversation on what is pastoral counseling. Okay. All right. So who wants to start? How would you define pastoral counseling? So I'm Terry Kanzanieri. I'm a pastoral counselor in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been doing this since around 1988. And I would say pastoral counseling has mostly to do with the spirituality of the practitioner so that I think of myself as someone who is integrating the best of theory in the behavioral health sciences, in mind-body science, all of the things of the healing arts, along with a theological understanding of the divine being somehow involved. So I think about it being my job to hold the space, make it a safe space for people to enter into conversation with me where they are engaged in the work of the divine, which from my perspective has to do with people always finding more and more capacity for self-expression, for freedom, for healing in their relationships with themselves, their people significant in their past and their present, and their own understanding of their place in the universe and what it is. So my job is to be with them, to listen to them, to help them in that conversation as they discover themselves and express themselves into the world. Wow. Okay. Don, you need to be taking notes because you were wondering. Excellent. I never heard. So I'm going to build on what Terry Canzanieri from Atlanta said. And who are you? And I am Beth Toller from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, via a lot of other places. Obviously, I'm not from Philly by the way I talk. <clears throat> and I'm a professor of pastoral counseling and theology and a master's in doctoral program at Newman University. So while I will agree with my esteemed colleague over here that pastoral counseling is about my internal um, framework and response and creating space for my clients to do all the things that she named so eloquently, I would also say that being a pastoral counselor is more explicit in my um, naming and assessing what's important for the client in the sense of what their understanding of spirituality is and how I understand spirituality is a person's lived um, experience and the way they live their values of how they understand themselves in the world um, in light of a higher power or not higher power. So my job is to help explicitly um, explore that 
and to explore the impact that their life experiences have on how they understand themselves in the world in light of a higher power or not higher power. So it's a both and. Sure. So my name is Dawn Starry. I'm a pastoral counselor in San Diego where I work primarily with refugees and Mm -hmm. asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. And the two things that come up often are when I'm talking about being a pastoral counselor is people ask, are you counseling pastors? No, not necessarily, though I would be open to that. Um, And do you have to talk about God? And so I will say with the population that I work with, certainly God does come up in its many manifestations throughout that work. But what I have said is that I feel very prepared to go there with that client because of my own theological reflection and my own work and my own relationship with God. Um, So I feel a level of comfort when that does come up in sessions for clients and really have felt that it is a gift to clients to have that relationship because overwhelmingly it's been positive, but it doesn't always come up. It isn't something that comes up, and it doesn't have to in the work that we do. And one of the things I would say about that is when I'm meeting a new client and I'm assessing what's going on with them and I'm getting their history, I want to know about their religious history because for some people, their religious history Mm -hmm. provides them with some resources, Mm -hmm. and for other people, their religious history provides them with trauma or harm. And to be able to be really well-versed and able to articulate where their religious experience or teaching might have been harmful and help them recover from that, or when they have resources, how to help avail those resources for their healing and their engaging for whatever's next for them. Uh, My name is Randy Simmons, and uh, I am a director of a Samaritan Counseling Center, Pastoral Counseling Center in the mountains of Colorado. So I want to follow up on what Terry just said, because my experience is I deal so much more with people who have had trauma or disappointment or betrayal from some religious institution or or pastor or church or whatever it is. Um, Up in the mountains of Colorado, I'm in a county of about 50,000 people, and we basically identify maybe 3,000 people that have any affiliation with any denomination, congregation, church, community, faith whatsoever. So, I mean, we're, we're in a sense kind of a mission field. I mean, literally less than, you know, 5% of our entire population has any affiliation with the congregation. And the reason that we, I found so much of that is true is because I've just said, I, I, I deal with more people who've had bad experiences in communities of faith that have had no experiences of community of faith. And so part of what I think my experience has been is really trying to help find, folks find that place of safety. And I mean, so much of what Terry just said is this real sense of um, the, the, the power of the resources of faith where so many folks have found so much of a trauma of faith. And so for me, it's been um, really kind of dealing, in, if you will, from the underside up because I, I deal with more people who've been hurt by faithing issues, or no, 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 not faithing issues, by communities of faith and experiences and people and judgment and that sort of thing. So I think the resources are trying to help be somewhat of a, a, a new voice about what faithing can be is an incredibly powerful place for what we do as pastoral counselors. I'm Wayne Gustafson, and I practice in upstate New York. Um, Often people will call and ask for an appointment, and I ask them why they've called me, and they say, well, I, I want a Christian counselor. And I'll say, well, what, what do you mean by that? Um, and sometimes it's simply a matter of I want somebody who will respect and, and help me to integrate what I believe into the work that I'm going to do with a, with a counselor. Other times they say, um, I, I've been told that if you understand the Bible properly that you'll know the right answers and I'm going to come to you so you can straighten me out. Mm-hmm. And, and I typically say if, if that second one is the one you're not, if you want, I'm not your guy. Yeah. Um, uh, I try to respect my clients very deeply um, and they come from uh, no religious background to very extensive religious backgrounds and I start with people where they are. Um, Often we deal with deeply spiritual issues without ever using any religious language. Um, often it's about questions of, of meaning, uh, questions of, of purpose, or uh, why are these things happening to me in my life. Um, there are times when 
uh, people really have a have a deep um, hunger for um, to to be more articulate about the spiritual in their lives, but they don't have the language to talk about it. And and sometimes the work that I do is to help them find ways to to express their inner experiences, um, always with the qualifier that whenever you take those experiences and put those into words, they end up sounding much more concrete and definite than the experience really is. Mm -hmm. But often it's the best we have, and and Mm -hmm. people find uh, a lot of comfort sometimes in in finding the language to to talk about what's happened in their lives because it also gives them a way to um, to, to put some meaning around it, and, and finding meaning can be very healing for them. Any other thoughts? If not, I have a question. So, so what did you, and anybody can answer this, what did you think pastoral counseling was going to be like before, you know, either you studied uh, pastoral counseling or you started practicing pastoral counseling? What did you think it was going to be like before, and what did you realize it was actually like afterwards? Um, this is Randy Simmons again. I'll take one shot at that. I'm not sure if this is exactly the answer, Trace, that you're asking for. Um, I, I remember when um, when I first graduated from seminary, Master of Divinity degree, um, I really thought I was going to be working in the church, a pastor. And so I started as a, a youth pastor in a fairly large church in Louisiana um, and was there for several years and then went back to seminary to really study to become a pastoral counselor. And um, I remember a few years after that, finished my degree, went back, and I was then a full-time counselor, director of a counseling center. Uh, one of the friends that had known me before, when I was actually working literally in the church, uh, this friend asked me, well, are, will you ever go back into the ministry? And um, it, it really kind of gave me pause because what I really said to them was, I never left. <laughs> because what I realized, and if some of what Wayne, I think, just said is sometimes the language that we use in, quote, the language of the church and the language we might use from behavioral sciences, what I've studied and learned in terms of integrating the pastoral counseling, spirituality, as well as behavioral sciences, um, is we, we find that bifurcation sometimes. You're either in the ministry or you're in the secular world, that, you know, the, the change between secular and sacred. I mean, I find that really confusing because it's almost like kind of saying, well, there's a whole part of the world in which God is actually not active or not even relevant. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me because mm-hmm. there's I don't see a difference. I don't see a, a separation between the sacred and the secular. I mean, so that that sense of the way that I think other people view a pastoral counselor from a psychologist or anything else I don't find that much difference, frankly. It, maybe it's a language of vocabulary, as Wayne was saying. We use one vocabulary that expresses something, but we're still talking about the whole. We're talking about you know a whole human being, and I don't know how you separate out the spiritual segments of a person from the psychological segments or the physical segments or the emotional segments. I think God made us as whole human beings, and I don't know how to separate those out. So I think this is Beth Toller again from... Philadelphia Newman University so I think for me when what what drew me into this field and what I thought I was getting into is exactly what it's turned out to be in the sense that it was a place where I could help people explore on a deeper level their identity um in the context and in light of their understanding of of God and the world and community and their family. Um, And I got into this business wanting to find a way to integrate um, solid clinical training with solid academic, theological, spiritual reflection training. And I've gotten exactly what I've come for. What is different than what I thought I was getting into is um, I feel like what I thought was going to be a prominent, preeminent voice in that discussion and in, in culture and in the field of psychotherapy or counseling um, is actually a light under the bushel and that some people have put a match and uh, lit the match and are putting that match um, 
on a candlestick for all to see and uh, and the field that I went into isn't <clears throat> helping that light burn as bright as it could. So this is Terry Kanzneri. Um I wanted to become a pastoral counselor at a time when, because I was a female and I was a Baptist, the field was not open to me. And um, I had to find another way to get credential to do what I wanted to do. So I went to social work school and I became a clinical social worker. And then I was licensed as a marriage and family therapy uh, therapist. And then later on, um, there the field was opening up for pastoral counseling and I went and did a residency. And what was really remarkable is I, when I was a social worker, I'd say, well, I'm a clinical social worker, and then I have to offer an explanation, and, or I'm a marriage and family therapist, but that didn't seem to totally capture who I was. And there was something about getting to pastoral counseling that whether or not it communicated to other people, for me, it sort of encapsulated that I am so grounded in uh, all of these streams of understanding the reality of the spiritual world and the presence of God, the capacity to think about this theologically so that it's not just about feeling and experience, but also how does one think about this in terms of the theological terms of redemption and health and healing, and also what is the best ongoing understanding of what makes a human being human from the um, uh, the research that's available in the whole psychosocial field and in brain studies and all of that, that it seemed to me all of this came together and I didn't need to explain it anymore, which wasn't necessarily true because other people didn't know what I was talking about. But within myself, it just felt like here were all these things came together and the expectation was that. And that by claiming that pastoral identity in that part, from my understanding, I was mediating grace, that there was the way in which it was almost a sacramental quality, mm -hmm. that the love of God was available mm -hmm. to people be, by the sacramental nature of the interaction we were having and the conversation we were having. Whether or not we ever used religious language, whether or not that was their faith tradition, I understood that the wisdom, the love, the creative potential that created us all and sustained us all was present in the room and, and active. And um, they're making fun of me for using my hands. But, um, <laughs> but, but I'm just saying that for me, that was really important to feel like I knew I was standing at this place, this holy space, listening to where the person in front of me, person or persons in front of me, were being met by the divine, and to hear what they were saying, to listen to them, and also listening to the promptings that was coming through me. And that since we were talking about this at dinner, it almost felt like when I was a mother who was nursing, there was a sense the more the child could suckle, the more milk came. The more these people could experience the grace, the more this grace came through me, and the more I benefited from this grace flowing through me to my clients. Mm -hmm. And it became really a holy moment. It was almost as if I was spending my whole day in meditation, mm -hmm. of being with people and being present in that moment, being attuned to what was happening by this grace flowing through me into the lives of these other people. Mm -hmm. And it's so holy and so sacred to get to have the opportunity to be with people who have all this um, their courage, their capacity to engage that, and how moving it is to be there and be present with them in those moments. Hi, Wayne Gustafson. Um, I, I was thinking about, it's been a long time since I entered this profession, somewhere back in the, well, I was doing ministry since 1971, and I think I started my pastoral counseling in in the late 80s. Um, and one of the things that I thought was that was that learning these tools and this perspective would actually allow me to do some things for people. Uh, and, and then I took this training with a bunch of other pastoral counselors in clinical hypnosis. And the psychiatrist who taught the course gave us a definition of psychotherapy in, in broad terms. And what he said was psychotherapy is the art of doing practically nothing creatively. And... <clears throat> And I've really used that uh, in, in two ways. Number one, to identify what really is my job. My job is to, as much as I can, create a safe and sacred space for my clients so that they can do their work. Um, 
also, um, we can use a lot of different kinds of language for this, but I think the other part of my job is to cooperate with the ever-present Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. the ever-present uh, healing process that in, in a physical way is like, um, if I break my ankle, how does it know how to heal itself? Well, my head doesn't know, but somehow that knowledge is there. And, and in terms of the healing that I see happening in people, when we create the safe space, um, and and <clears throat> that provides a kind of structure mm. that allows the healing to take place, and it's not anything that I do, and I like that part a lot mm. that I don't really have to do anything. So I'm gonna speak with and contrast with my um, esteemed colleagues and elders in the field. As a pastoral counselor, I do not assume that it is God or the Holy Spirit that is in the room. Mm -hmm. Because I start with the client and their reality and their understanding, again, of themselves in light of the world and um, their community and their family. So, in a sense... In that framework, what pastoral counseling has trained me to do is to know the questions to ask and the presence to cultivate um, that allows me to sit with someone who may or may not have a theistic um, tradition or even have a theistic notion of the way the world works. Mm -hmm. So I do not assume that it is the Holy Spirit that is work in the room. I don't even assume that God is in the room. Um, because I have to trust that what the client brings and how that interacts with the space that I create um, is is the larger thing at work, and I don't pretend to know that how to define that or how to name that. Um, I, I don't see that's in contrast at all to what I said. I, I really don't because well, it is because if you use the language. well, that's but that's what I'm saying. The language is just the language. The way I use it, the language is just the language. I could say all the same things without using any language that had the slightest bit of, uh, of religious tone to it at all. You know, I could talk about the, uh, about the body and the mind's natural healing process. I, can, I could talk about how that gets, um, gets blocked up. Um, and stands in the way of people's healing. It doesn't require theological language. All I'm saying is that that's one way to talk about it. And <clears throat> I don't even know what I mean by those words. I just know that those are words that point beyond themselves to a, to a reality that, uh, that I'm, um, through experience, I'm pretty convinced is there, but I don't have to put any particular name on it to know the reality of it. This is pointing to a very interesting, um, what's the word? Uh, a dichotomy. very, uh, not just dichotomy, but, but, um, <clears throat> when and, when and how you got trained. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're assuming that a language that you're using translates, um, or means the same thing as, um, even if you don't know that's true. And my training in a pastoral tradition says that I can't make that assumption um, that that what, what arises and what is created, um, I cannot subsume under uh, any category that I bring or name. I can't assume a correlation, and I can't even assume a connection. So here's where my bias comes in. It's Terry again. So I think I had a reaction against people in my early training who talked as if it were possible for therapists to be blank screens. Mm -hmm. And you can't. you mm -hmm. got to own who you are and what totally you believe. Agree. And so for me, I have to own that for me, I can't conceive of God not being present everywhere, whatever God is. I can't say I know what that means. But I also think it's really important. I did a consultation with this person one time, and I said to her, I have a lot of strong beliefs, and one of my strong beliefs is I may be wrong. So 
I have to start with owning this is how I think about it, but that's limited. And I'm certainly not going to impose my language on others or my concepts, but I have to own this is the understanding I start with and then set that aside to be with them where they are, hear what they bring in, what they understand, and where they're coming from and engage them with their language and their concepts and begin there with the understanding they may never be with me and there's no need for them to be right. with me. And I totally agree with that. And what I don't hear you saying, but is important to clarify is that what you name as God as the Holy S- and the Holy Spirit or sin or whatever language you want to use. I didn't say sin. No, ahead, I'm yeah. just trying to <laughs> expand the, yeah. the linguistics around our tradition, right? That you can't, not you can't it's it's not just about owning that language and setting it aside is that you can't use that as a correlative connection of oh well that person is just correct. talking about correct yeah to not disrespect at all I, mean, I know that the best i can ever do is a metaphor so this is my metaphor but it's not better than anybody else's metaphor well, and i want to understand connected to the metaphor. it may not be right. so if i'm going to do my job i'm going to be with that mm-hmm. person and understand where that person is coming from what that person's bringing and to speak that person's language and not subsume it correct internally or correct. externally but to pretend i don't have what i have oh, totally. when i get away and think about it is disingenuous i think we should go on the road probably with your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> good so far uh, so another question that I have, or actually this is probably something you've heard before uh, that you probably answer, but I can imagine that some people say, or maybe you have heard people say this before, is how is what you do any different than what my pastor can do? Your pastor, God love him or her, um, has been in one of my seminary classes, and I know that they have one class of pastoral care and their complete training. So my hope when I, when a person leaves one of my intro to pastoral care counseling classes in seminary is that they have the good sense about them to know what they can and can't do and they know when to make a referral. Yeah. So your pastor can offer support and your pastor is an entryway to the kinds of support that pers- someone really needs. And in addition to that, I work in an Episcopal church where they have the wisdom that a a parish priest can't see somebody more than three times. Mm -hmm. Because even if that person has the skill set, their life would be taken over Mm -hmm. by that. So here's what I do. And then when you need more than that, let me send you to someone that that is that person's work. Mm -hmm. So that 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 priest is then available to continue his or her own job. Right need to add to that one too because this is this is an important thing to say and and that is that even if the person has the expertise and the time doing the kind of deep psychotherapy that we do with people sets up a dual relationship Mm -hmm. so it's impossible to continue to function with that person around the normal functioning of the church once that deeper uh, psychotherapeutic relationship has has been established so so there are a number of reasons why uh, pastors doing this sort of uh, counseling with their client with their parishioners is not a good idea other than in very uh, very specific short-term kinds of situations this just wraps up everything else everybody just said but I mean would you want to go to a first-year medical student to have heart surgery uh, I, I think, okay, okay. Well, I, again, I know that's, that's a very simplistic metaphor, but just as a pastor is trained in wonderful ways of biblical knowledge and understanding and supportive therapy, uh, the, it's not the depth of care any more than a first-year medical student would have with medical practice. Additionally, what, what you said, um, one, of, one of you said, oh, you said about about knowing your limits and when to refer. That's also true for every psychotherapist and pastoral counselor. We also need to pay very close attention to our limits and when to refer. Sometimes the difference between the professional counselor and the pastor is the professional counselor really does know where those lines are. And for the pastor, it's often fuzzier. And that makes it dangerous. So let me speak very clearly to your audience. 
your pastor has had at most one course and they are not qualified to help you in the way you need help. Well put. Uh, <laughs> Did Flo have something to say? Did you have well, I hate to I hate to disturb the balance of this of this group. The, um, I'm Flo Dewitt, and I work in a a group practice um, that is all pastoral counselors. Um, but we're not ident- You know, we're not in a church. Okay. Um, it's interesting. We um, we have a number of counselors who come to us after they've been pastors and they've gone back and they've gotten their uh, counseling training and it's really interesting to watch them evolve as from pastor to uh, pastoral counselor and they will often say in group supervision they'll say something like if if I were this person's pastor this is what I would say. And it's often something about giving advice and telling them what to do. Now that I'm a counselor, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say. So it's a new skill. It's a new way of thinking about relationship. And um, it's, it's very interesting to watch that evolution and to help them grow out of the role of pastor, I think it has a lot to do too with people's expectations. People expect their pastor to to give them advice, to give, to tell them what to do, to fix whatever problem they have. People don't expect that of their of their therapist or their counselor. Can I add one thing? I had, had somebody call one time for an appointment, and I knew, and I knew that she was coming from a a pretty conservative uh, church, and so. Um, I I was really curious to know why she was calling me uh, uh, for counseling and uh, and and I was clear about what I do and what I don't do and you know I don't um, I don't quote the Bible at people and I don't tell them you know what's the correct thing to do theologically and whatnot and and she said I know that if I wanted that I'd go to my pastor (laughs) so what what do you say to somebody who says I feel like you're watering it down. I feel like you need to just tell me what the Bible says. Have you ever had that happen with a client at all? Or maybe yeah. somebody from that time? You, I, yeah. What's your response to that? What's my response? So my, my response, like any good therapist would be, I'm happy to share with you what I understand the Bible to say about this matter. But what I'm curious about is why that is an important thing for you and what's bringing your question up right now. And... If you want that answer for me, I'm in, in, a, in a good mutually reciprocal fashion, I'm happy to share my perspective. And I want to know what your wisdom is, and I want to know where your concern is coming from. Um, and, and my job is to lay out the options, so to speak, the understandings, and to help you work through and find your own way. I guess the thing I want to say in addition to that is um, it's, it's, it is a stretch for most pastoral counselors to find a way to be respectful of people who have a belief system that feels um, limiting. And so how to love people where they are and ask the questions Beth was talking about that helps people expand the possibility. And really to ask about what's the fear behind that question, which Mm -hmm. almost always is a fear of what will happen if I'm doing something outside of what I was taught Mm -hmm. the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between for people to somehow begin to talk about um, there's more than one way to understand this scripture. There's more than one way to understand this teaching. There's more than one. But you have to be, from, in my experience with people who have a more conservative understanding than mine, to be gentle mm-hmm. and patient and loving and certainly not judgmental mm-hmm. about where they find themselves. And I trust they would not be there with me if there were not some part of them wanting to broaden that a little bit or have some other understanding beyond where they were when they came in. And for a lot of people, there's that fear that maybe something's wrong with me, that the old answers aren't working anymore. 
and to have somebody, they may be with a pastoral counselor because they want somebody who also has a faith tradition, but who doesn't see things in quite the way they were taught. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Claire Bamberg, various backgrounds. <laughs> I did a lot. I did a lot of work with uh, satanic ritual abuse survivors. Mm-hmm. The use of language, the understanding of theology to undo what's been done to them, mm-hmm. the ability to listen and hear beyond the words, mm-hmm. the ability to not be disturbed by their experience away from my understanding of the sacred. Mm-hmm. And to allow them to uncover, discover, respond, use me as a lightning rod or board, sounding board. And the fact that I knew I was onto something when they could say, you're weird, because you're unlike anything I've ever experienced. Mm-hmm. And to be able to sit there and hold that space mm-hmm. for them to uncover and discover that my God is different than what they were told God was. And to be able to explore that in a, a place that's safe and not punishing and not a trick and not going to take them away from their selves or life is kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. And some <laughs> of the most powerful experiences I've had were when I had unexpected tears with people. Mm-hmm. So I had a client who was uh, eight and a half months pregnant who had a pulmonary embolism and she and her baby died. And I had actually performed the wedding for her and her husband, which I know people may have opinions about whether or not that's okay, but I had done that. And um, he came to me in the aftermath and was saying to me that in his belief system, God doesn't give us more than we can bear. So that if his faith had not been so strong, his wife and child would not have died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when he told me that, I wept. And to be able to weep with him about Mm -hmm. my understanding of God, who grieves with him and who was not punishing or didn't design Mm -hmm. this, was a very important moment. And to acknowledge with him, you and I may not ever see this the same way. (coughs) We may not ever agree But it's important for me, for you to know that in my experience, there's another understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Terry, I think you're, you're, this is uh, Flo DeWitt, I think you're talking about the deep empathy Mm -hmm. that we have the luxury of participating in and that perhaps the questions that people come in wanting (coughs) It seems like they want some sort of answer that will, they think will help. But usually underneath that, I think, is the fear that you said, mm-hmm. the uh, wish to bring that wife and child back, that bargaining or that struggle Wanting in grief. Right. And so to, to be able to answer those questions with empathy Mm-hmm. To say to that person who says, just give me the answer, you know, if only, yeah. if like only that. someone could tell me how to live, how to take away this pain, mm-hmm. or if only I could bring back, if only there was something I could do to bring my wife and baby back. Yeah. And to be in that space with that person mm-hmm. that brought those tears mm-hmm brought your tears, you were so much in that space with, with him mm-hmm. that you felt his pain mm-hmm. and he knew it. Yeah, and I think like from a training perspective when I work with budding counselors or even um, ministers who are entering various forms of ministry, everyone says, what do I do when someone looks me in the eye and asks me a question? Mm-hmm. And and at first glance, my answer may seem to be like a sidestep or trickery, but it's really that first move of empathy, which is what I tell my students is to ask the question, where is that question coming from and where are you feeling? And I say to them 9.5 times out of 10, after you ask that question, they're not going to come back to you and want to know your answer. Yeah. Because they just needed to be heard. Yeah. They needed that underlying emotion 
to be named yeah. mm-hmm. and embraced and honored. Mm-hmm. So I just, this is Dawn again. I just wanted to say that they're def- so in the work I've done, there are moments where with trauma survivors, so these are primary and secondary survivors of torture that I work with. And so there are moments where I'm like, I don't know. Like I, li- I will say a prayer and say, give me the words. Mm. And so I had a story. I was reminded when Terry shared her story of a client. It was a young woman in her 20s, and she was um, persecuted in Ethiopia for her political views, and she and her fiancé left. And she was pregnant, and somewhere in South Africa, they were parted because of chaos. It was a group of people, and it was just chaos. Mm. And when I met her, she was pregnant enough to be showing and she wore this very long necklace of the cross that was on her belly and she said to me and we met like at a McDonald's <laughs> like so we're at this McDonald's together because we couldn't go to her home and there's a variety of things and um she said to me people tell me this is what God wanted mm. and even now it like brings tears mm. to my eyes and I don't know if I said what I would have been trained to say. But in that moment, I said, that's that's not the God that I believe in. Mm. Mm. And that, and she just said, thank you. Mm. And mm. that was all she needed in that moment to just know that God wouldn't punish her. I'm crying now. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably all the point. But um, that God wouldn't punish her in that way or her baby and, like, separate her from this man that she loves and felt, you know, safe with. And now she felt so vulnerable with in this country. Um because people believe some things that cannot all simultaneously be true. Mm-hmm. God is all loving. God is all powerful. Mm-hmm. Bad things happen. Right. So people fudge it one way or the other. And a lot of people fudge it toward, oh, there's not really anything bad. It's just good we don't understand yet. Mm-hmm. Or people like, God's not really all loving. God's kind of pissed off. Mm-hmm. Or God's not really powerful. Mm-hmm. God's giving it all away. Right. So whatever we sort of decide, it's everything we, every solution we have has a problem. Mm-hmm. But I think for a lot of people to say, for whatever reason, the world is set in motion, and God may be not be di- dictating, right. but God is present with us. So that famous story of the person saying, where was God right. when I was raped? God was being raped with you mm-hmm. and crying with mm-hmm. you is a very different perspective mm-hmm. for people about their suffering. Right, absolutely. So to tie on less poignantly and emotionally, the God that Dawn and Terry just spoke of, so this is Beth again, is not just a God that suffers with, but it is a God of questions and not answers. Mm-hmm. Pastoral counselors are the people who, like the visitor that showed up with Jacob, that will wrestle mm-hmm. and... Mm-hmm. Um, get in the muck Mm -hmm. and that's what they want to do they're not interested in answers or wrapping anything up neatly Mm -hmm. because there are no answers Um, the pastoral counselors are a part of the God who wrestles with Jacob Mm -hmm. the end (laughs) so for somebody who's interested in pastoral counseling how do they join AAPC? Yeah, yeah. So there are a number of ways, right? <laughs> so AAPC is all over the, the nation and international. So there is a website, aapc.org, and then there are regions. You can look up the regions. There are contact persons in each region, and you contact those people, and you will be welcomed in in a way that will help you figure out how to find your place in the organization. Mm-hmm. And do it's enjoy. just a way. Mm-hmm. This is this is your professional group. Mm-hmm. More than any other group out there, this is the group where you will find collegiality, mm-hmm. you'll find scholarship, you'll find challenging conversation, and we want you. We really want you to come be with us. Yeah. But, and I can't, so I, I will say very quickly, you asked, like, if I if pastoral counseling was what I expected. So I really stumbled upon it. I was getting a master's in theology, religious educa- religious studies. I don't remember anymore. And so <laughs> I was, I, for a variety of reasons, I moved to San Diego, and I literally Googled University of San Diego. There was one, and they have this pastoral. Jesuits. This, 
not Jesuit. It's not oh, Jesuit. It was started by the diocesan, the Sisters of Sacred Heart. And so we, uh, they had a master's in pastoral care and counseling. And so I was able to take my work in the master's religious studies and go into pastoral care and counseling. I did not know what I was getting myself into, but I have, despite myself, been open to the Spirit, and I cannot say enough how wonderful it is to be amongst people that get me and that I can talk about these things in the wrestling um, and the questions I have and, like, God in the world and God in my life and God in the life of my clients, and that um, that is not frowned upon it's not generalized it's really dug into deeply and it's profoundly informed who i am and the work that i do 